All right, today we're going to start in on um, spontaneity, entropy, and what's called free energy. And we're going to start with spontaneous processes and this term called entropy, which we haven't really dealt with all that much. Um, reminder, first law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be heat created or destroyed, and we always talk about heat flowing from one thing to something else. So we talk about something losing heat or gaining heat, and that perspective is pretty important. Now, as a reminder, some of our abbreviations, T is temperature, Q is equal to heat, E is equal to energy, and H is this term called enthalpy. And for a lot of times, the way that we study reactions, the change in enthalpy can equal the energy flow as heat. Okay, so a lot of times, remember, we had our delta H, and delta H could equal our heat flow um, <coughs> to make the math a little bit easier. Okay, so this is just as a reminder. Uh, the domain of thermodynamics talks about the energy differences, okay, where you start and where you end. So do the reactants and the products have a higher or lower energy, et cetera. Um, and then we have this middle pathway here, which is when the reaction actually takes place, and this is the domain of kinetics. So this is how fast does it happen. This is things like activation, energy, um, and how fast or slow we can make those happen. Thermodynamics is going to look at the, or thermochemistry is going to look at the actual energy change. Okay, now entropy has a abbreviation of the letter S, and it's a measure of chaos or randomness. Now, I'm really not going to get into a lot of depth on this, um, just because I don't have the time to, but it's just randomness of particles and, and chaos of particles. And the driving force for a spontaneous reaction is actually a little bit opposite, I think, from what we might think, in that it's actually an increase in entropy, okay? That spontaneous um, a lot of times requires you know, energy being lowered, but it also requires an increase in this entropy. And the natural tendency is to go from low to high S or low to high entropy. Um, entropy also describes the number of possible positions of a molecule. So in other words, how many places in space or positions in space can it happen, can it have? And the entropy of a solid is significantly less than a liquid, and it's way significantly less than a gas. Remember, even if you just think about our energy continuum for kinetic energy, um, and temperature, remember gases are thousands of times um, less dense and have that much more kinetic energy than liquids and solids. So gases really have significantly larger amounts of positions that they can occur in. Okay, now spontaneous or spontaneity will occur without, sa without outside intervention. Okay, so it's not something that we force to happen by loading one side of the equation. Um, thermodynamic, thermodynamics, again, we'll remember, will tell us the direction that a reaction will be spontaneous in, but it does not tell us anything about the speed. Okay, that's going to come from kinetics. So thermodynamics only considers the initial and the final states and not necessarily the pathway. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we don't consider intermediates, you know, and, and we break, we purposely break things down when we do like Hess's law problems, but we mostly, for thermodynamics, look at the beginning and the end and the different ways that we, some of the things we can get there. And again, we have to use both kinetics and thermodynamics to completely understand a reaction in terms of how fast it goes and all the energy that's related to that. Okay, and remember, what makes a reaction spontaneous? And when we're answering this question, really what we've talked about to this point is that mostly exothermic reactions are spontaneous, ones that release energy and cause them to um, have a lower energy than what they, than the products and the reactants. So that's typically spontaneity, and we're going to talk about um, with entropy what that means as well. All right, now some examples. If we just first look at these, this is 16.1 and 16.2. Um, it says, which one has the higher positional entropy? So in other words, which one has the greatest, more randomness? If we're looking at solid carbon dioxide or gaseous carbon dioxide, it's going to be gaseous carbon dioxide. You may have to circle some of these, um, your final answers here. <coughs> Will nitrogen gas at 1 atm or nitrogen gas at 0 0.01 atm have more pressure? I'm sorry, have more spontaneity? Well, it's going to be at 0 0.01 atm with a little bit less pressure. Um, that will have higher positional entropy, mostly because it has more freedom to move around. Okay, so it's not squeezed together as much. Um, now, if we predict the signs of delta S, um, this is just, if it's increasing the randomness, it's going to be positive. 
Okay, if it's decreasing, it's going to be negative. Um, solid sugar is added to water. It's positive because all of a sudden there's a larger volume for the sugar to move around in. Or I just think of it as you dump something in and you dissolve it. They now have that much more freedom to move in that aqueous state as opposed to that solid state. If iodine vapor condenses on a cold surface to form crystals, this is going to be negative. It's a little bit tough to see. Um, because the gas is turning into a solid, there's less move volume and less movement as well. Okay, so you have less spontaneity. Okay, now... <clears throat> Excuse me, now we're going to talk about entropy in the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics pretty much states that in any spontaneous reaction, so one that is automatically happening, we don't have to reverse it, we don't have to add to it, you know, force it to generate, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe. Okay, so there's always a little bit of this increase in randomness that's going on in the universe. So what means is that the delta S of the universe is going to be equal to the delta S of the surroundings plus the delta S of the system. Um, remember, we talked about this with um, Thermo, where I would kind of draw this little circle to represent the system, and we would have this, if energy was flowing out, we called it exothermic. If energy was flowing in, we called it endothermic. And you still have to remember that the surroundings is everything that's out here. The system is what's kind of in the bubble or in the container. So, we want spontaneity, for something to be spontaneous, the delta S of the universe has to be, um, we need a, an increase in spontaneity. So if, if delta S of the system is negative, it can still be spontaneous, so long as the delta S of the surroundings is larger and positive. Okay, so so long as the universe wins out, something can still run. Um, so if the delta S of the universe is greater than zero, it's spontaneous. If the delta S of the universe is equal to zero, there's no tendency, it's at equilibrium. If the delta S of the universe is less than zero, it's going to be spontaneous in reverse. And remember, that's why when we started talking about equilibrium, we really talked about reactions going in opposite orders, because you could just, you know, force them to go in a different direction, and that's where we get a lot of that equilibrium concentrations as well. Okay, the last piece we got to talk about today is the effect of temperature on spontaneity. Um, remember, temperature and kinetic energy are going to be directly related, so as one goes up, the other goes up molecules move faster, they're going to have more randomness. So clearly that temperature is going to change it. Okay, if we look at this process up here, we've got liquid water vaporizing to gaseous water. <clears throat> now, if you just think about this system um, from a spontaneity standpoint, the delta S of the surrounding system, rather, is going to have a positive sign because of an increase in the number of positions. The delta S of the surroundings is mostly determined by heat flow. Um, vaporization is endothermic. Right, those liquid particles are absorbing energy so that they can increase in kinetic energy and go up to those gaseous particles. So it's going to remove heat from the surroundings. So it will actually decrease the random motion of the surroundings. So it has a negative delta S of the surroundings. Okay, so we have some different signs here. Because remember, this the universe has to win. So the universe has to get increased in entropy for this to be a random act to occur. Um, now, if the delta S and the delta, delta S of the system and the surroundings have different signs, the temperature will determine it. Because if there's enough, a high enough temperature, so to speak, for everybody to recover, we're good. If it's below a certain level, it's not going to happen. So for the vaporization of water, it, it, we kind of start here to make it easy perspective. It's, it's, if it's above 100 degrees Celsius, the delta S of the universe is positive, okay, because there's plenty of energy around to flow into that system um, to allow the randomness to occur. If vaporization of water uh, tries to occur below delta S, then the delta, uh, below 100 degrees Celsius, then the delta S of the universe is negative. Okay, so we've got... Um, you know, some changes on those things. And the impact of the heat transfer will be greater at lower temperatures because there isn't as much to play with. Okay, if you, these above 100 degrees Celsius, you've got more kinetic energy, you've got more spontaneity, you start to lower that temperature, you don't have as much play in the randomness that's there. And that impacts things. Okay, so the signs which are important, okay, you need to be able to remember what this is going to look like and how these go. Depends on, like I said, depends on the direction of the heat flow. Typically, the delta S of the surroundings is positive for exothermic reactions. Okay, so if you get an exothermic reaction, it's going to increase energy, it's going to increase the randomness. It's going to be negative for endothermic reactions because they're going to have to suck some energy in from the outside for it to occur. And the magnitude <coughs> depends on the temperature. Okay, heat flow, remember, is equal to delta H at constant pressure. Um, it's going to be very small at high temperature. It's going to increase as temperature decreases. So, in other words, it's not going to have a huge effect 
often it happens at really high temperatures, and that's going to change um, as the temperature decreases, and there just isn't as much energy to go around. And this is our equation for this. Um, delta S of the surroundings is equal to negative delta H of the reaction over the temperature that it occurs at. Okay, so a um, little summary here. This is a nice chart. It's chart table 16.3. Um, if you're stuck on these signs, you may want to go back to your textbook and read about this just a little bit because um, it's tricky. Okay, so if you just look at the signs, this is the big stuff. If they're all positive, absolutely will automatically happen. If they're all negative, nope, it's going to happen in the opposite direction. You're going to reverse it. Um, if you have positive and negative combinations, it depends. It's going to depend on the temperature. So if the delta S of the system has a larger magnitude, then yes. If in flip side, this time if the delta S of the surrounding has has a larger magnitude. Okay, so in other words, if it's at a high enough temperature that it doesn't necessarily cause too much of an issue. So let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, if I have a process where delta H, you you don't have the work, but let me explain it up here first. Okay, process is a delta H of plus 22 kilojoules and a delta S of negative 13 kilojoules. I think on your notes there's a rant, the negative sign got stuck like up here so you want to make sure that you know that this is negative 13 joules um, over Kelvin. It says at what temperature is this process spontaneous? Okay well it's not just a simple yes or no because we have one positive and we had one negative. So now if there is no subscript to this okay then the delta S is going to equal to the delta to the delta of the system of the surroundings. So, delta S of the universe has to be greater than zero for it to be spontaneous. Again, they both have to add up to equal to zero. So essentially what we have to figure out is the temperature where it's going to equal zero, and anything above that will be good shape. Okay, so here is the equation that we had from before. Okay, we had from before our delta S is equal to negative delta H over T. What we're going to do is set up an inequality, okay? So we need this whole thing, the delta S, and remember, the delta, okay, hold on, I'm doing a bad job here. This right here on our equation was equal to the delta S of the surroundings. We need both of these two things to be greater than zero. So here's our delta S for the system. Here is what we're going to calculate for the delta S for the surroundings. We need them to be greater than equal to greater than zero. So we set them up as inequality. Here's our delta S of the surrounding of the system rather, the negative 13 joules over Kelvin. Plus we've got negative. Now this was in kilojoules. We went ahead and converted it to joules by multiplying multiplying it by a thousand. We put it over the, that energy, and we were looking for this temperature. Okay, so all we're doing is manipulating the equation to solve for this temperature to figure out what this has to be larger than. Okay, so when we do the math, we end up with 1700 Kelvin, which is clearly a very large number and a very large temperature, but if it's over 1700 Kelvin, then it's spontaneous. If it's less than 1700 Kelvin, then it's not spontaneous. Okay, so that's where we get that, react, where we get that math set up for. Okay, now, let's see, we got one more here. Again, you don't have the work for this. You have everything else. But for methanol, the enthalpy of vaporization, so that's the energy it takes to vaporize one mole to go from a liquid to a gas. Okay, 71.8 kilojoules per mole. And this is, remember, these enthalpies of vaporization, this is, the, this is a reflection of um, essentially how strong intermolecular forces are. Because if this number is larger, They've got stronger intermolecular forces. If it's weaker, they've got weaker intermolecular forces. Okay, so we've got the enthalpy of vaporization, and the entropy of vaporization is 213 joules over Kelvin. What is the normal boiling point of methanol? Now, again, you may be going, how the heck am I possibly supposed to figure that out? Okay, well, what did they tell me? The delta S for the system is 213 joules over Kelvin. Okay, because that's the entropy of vaporization. That's what's going on in that system at that time. Delta H is, we're going to, again, we're going kilojoules to joules to get 71,800 joules over moles times Kelvin. At the boiling point, vaporization begins to be spontaneous. So if we can figure out, again, at what temperature that this can be spontaneous, then we know what the boiling point is. So we set our, we need our delta S of the universe equal to be zero. So at the boiling point, again, we take the delta S 
plus of the system plus the delta s of the surroundings has to be equal to zero. So here's where we substitute the reaction. This time we're just going to set it equal to zero because we're just trying to figure out what the boiling point actually is. Plug in our 213, plug in our 71,000, we end up with 337 Kelvin or 64 degrees Celsius for the boiling point. Okay. You also have one more example on page 793, 16.4, and we will pick up with the rest of entropy 